Wieland-Forum hier auf der Frankfurter Buchmesse. Ähm, auch wenn ich gerade in diese Richtung nicht viel sehe, ähm, es freut uns, dass so viele Leute heute gekommen sind, um unserem Gespräch zu lauschen über die sicherlich bekannteste Kinder- und Jugendbuchautorin Neuseelands, Margaret Mahi. Bevor wir ähm, loslegen, ganz kurz ein organisatorischer Hinweis. Wir werden unser Gespräch auf Englisch führen. Es gibt aber eine simultane Übersetzung ins Deutsche. Wenn Sie das möchten, können Sie sich dort hinten die Kopfhörer abholen, damit Sie auch nichts verpassen von unserem Gespräch. Okay, you were wondering why I'm, I'm talking German. <laughs> Not at all, okay. Um, so, kia ora and welcome to um, the New Zealand Pavilion at the Frankfurt Book Fair. My name is Claudia Zöffner. I work at the International Youth Library in Munich, and I have the great honor and pleasure today to have with me three of the most um, popular and creative uh, people, creators of children's literature from New Zealand. And um, we're going, during that next hour, we're going to talk about one very, very special person, a person that I think almost everybody knows, um, the great dame of New Zealand children's literature, Margaret Mahi. Before I tell you a little bit more about Margaret, if that's um, at all necessary, I would like to introduce the guests who are with me this afternoon. And I was told to keep it as brief as possible, so I thought maybe if I just mention the names, welcome Joy Cowley, David Elliott and Katie Goldie but that might be taking brief a bit too literal. So um, if you bear with me um, a few more minutes, I would like to start with the person to my uh, far left, Joy Cowley, um, born as Cassia Joy Summers in Levin, New Zealand, which is about 90 kilometers north of the capital Wellington. She was born in 1936, uh, the same year as Margaret Mahi. And just like Margaret, she's also the oldest of five siblings. So um, this is some of the things that she has in common, um, by far not um, the only ones. And I know that, Joy, you're probably going to tell us a little bit more about that later on, so I didn't want to spoil the surprise by mentioning it all in the beginning. But what I do want to say, that um, just like Margaret, Joy is one of the most popular and prolific New Zealand children's book authors, and um, I assume it's probably, you're probably the only one who has published even more books than Margaret has. Um, in the course of your career as a writer, um, you have written for both adults and children, um, won many awards, um, one of them being the Margaret Mahi Award in 1993. And just to give you a rough idea of her output, um, in addition to about 40-some picture books um, and numerous children's novels, she's created about 500 so-called readers or storybooks that um, help children learn to read. And I know that this is a field that Joy is very passionate about. Um, in Germany, unfortunately, um, only very few books of hers are away available. And um, the most recent one, is a book called Snake and Lizard, or Schlange und Eidex auf Deutsch. And this is a book about the wonderful friendship between the snake and the lizard, and it's also the book that Joy read a story from at the uh, opening ceremony on Tuesday night. Um, Joy met Margaret more than 40 years ago and has been a close friend of hers ever since. And um, she's going to share with us some of her personal memories. Welcome, Joy. The second person on stage to my left is Kate de Goldie. Kate was born and grew up in Christchurch, um, but for the past 15 years, I read you've been living in Wellington. So um, a change from the south to the North Island. Like Margaret Mahi, she also started writing at a very young age. Um, during her childhood, she is said to have filled one exercise book after the other with her stories, and she even got her classmates to act out her plays. Um, she began her serious literary career by writing short stories and published her first novel for adults in 1994 under the name of Kate Flannery. And since then, she's won several awards, written four books for young adults and three children's books illustrated by Jackie Colley. 
German readers will certainly have heard about Kate's most recent um, book for young adults. It's the 10 p.m. question, published in 2008. In German, the title is Abends um 10. And this has won awards both in New Zealand and abroad, including the Corinne Prize in Germany last year. And in September, right before coming here, um, Kate traveled around Germany, attending both the International Literature Festival in Berlin and the Harbour Front Literature Festival in Hamburg, where she read and discussed liter literature at various events. Um, besides writing her own books, um, Kate's also very well known as an energetic book reviewer, and um, she reviews both for radio and television. And she's long been an admirer and friend of Margaret Mahi and her work. And she's going to um, give us a bit more insight into her work today. Welcome, Kate. And then last but not least, in the middle, David Elliott. He was born in Ashburton, which he just told me is <laughs> the most boring uh, town or city in New Zealand. <laughs> Sorry to, to put that in. <laughs> but now he lives in Dunedin, which is on the South Island. It's a very beautiful city. Um, before he became a full-time illustrator in 1998, he had a go at a number of different and very interesting jobs. I read that among them you were working as a dishwasher in Antarctica, um, an interior designer, a teacher, and a gatekeeper at Edinburgh Zoo. And um, you said that this proved to be a seminal experience for your career as an illustrator, because then you had the time to study animals and you had lots of time to actually draw them. Um, David has created six picture books of his own, including Sydney the Penguin books and Pictes the Pirate. Um, he has illustrated a wide range of children's books, including poetry, short stories, um, children's novels, and picture books, both for other New Zealand writers and uh, also for authors in the UK and the US. And his latest picture book, Henry's Map, will be published in the US in 2013. Um, Unfortunately, none of his picture books are translated into German yet, but we're hoping this is going to change very soon. Uh, the reason he's joining us today is that he also collaborated with Margaret on two books, um, the first one being The Word, which um, published in 2009, which is a collection of Margaret's poetry. And in 2010, they worked together in The Moon on Farmer McPhee, which you have a copy of right now, yeah. Um, and this won the New Zealand Post Children's Book Award, and we're eager to hear all about your collaboration. Welcome, David. Um, so now you know the people on stage, but there are two more people that I would like to welcome, especially because we have two very special guests with us in the audience, and that's Margaret's daughter, Bridget, and grandson, Harry, and they're at the back over there, I can't see them. Yeah, they're waving there and supporting us tonight. And they're um, basically, um, Bridget is going to be carrying on Margaret's work and, and taking care of her legacy and um, spreading the word around. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. But now to the person that we're talking about tonight, um, Margaret Mahi. I think t for most people she doesn't really need an introduction, but there might be um, the odd German who hasn't come across her work yet, so I'm going to um, say a few words about her. She was born in Wakatana, which is on the North Island, um, in 1936, as the eldest of five children, as I mentioned, and her father was a bridge builder, her mother a teacher, and they both taught stories and read books to all their children. Margaret loved language, she loved stories, and she also loved writing them. And her first story was published in the children's page of a newspaper when she was only seven. Even though she decided quite early on that she wanted to become a writer, um, all the adults around her kept telling her that that was simply impossible. She wouldn't be able to make a living from that. So in the end, she decided to um, study for a BA degree in English and philosophy, among other subjects, and afterwards um, went to the New Zealand Library School in Wellington to get a second degree in librarianship. And then she worked as a librarian for many, many years while bringing up her two daughters on her own. Um, in addition to all the hard work, she always kept writing stories in her what we call spare time, which was often late at night when the children were in bed. 
Um, during the first years, quite a few of her stories were published in the wonderful publication, the New Zealand School Journal, but somehow the other New Zealand publishers weren't too keen on her work. Um, it's got something to do with, or they told her, they're not New Zealand enough um, in the beginning. However, her international career took off in 1969 when A Lion in the Meadow and four other stories were published as picture books by the US publisher Franklin Watts. After working very hard um, in basically two full-time jobs for many, many years, um, she finally decided in 1980 to become what she had always wanted to do and become a full-time writer. In total, Margaret has written more than 100 picture books, about 300 short stories, probably hundreds of poems, and numerous novels for children and teenagers. In, a, and in addition, she's also written extensively for theatre and television, and her work has been translated into 15 languages. The awards she received um, are far too numerous to um, list them all, among them are the Esther Glenn Medal and the New Zealand Post Children's Book Award in New Zealand, the Carnegie Medal in the UK. Um, she was even made a member of the Order of New Zealand for her contribution to New Zealand children's literature. And there is a medal, an award named after her, the Margaret Mahi Medal. Um, I probably could go on and on and bore you to death, but I'm not going to do that. Um, the, probably the most important award came in 2006, and this was just in time for her 70th birthday, and that she won the Hans Christian Andersen Award, which is also sometimes called the um, Nobel Prize for Children's Literature for her body of work. What we would like to do um, in the next um, 45 minutes um, is talk about her life, um, her as a person, her work, of course. And what we would have really loved to do was, would, of course, be um, ask her all kinds of questions in person. But unfortunately, this is not possible because many of you will have heard that she passed away in July, which is very sad. However, um, even if she can't be with us in person, um, her spirit is certainly with us. And um, I've already heard lots of uh, lovely, funny and interesting stories um, while we were preparing this panel. Um, luckily, what we do have is we have some audiovisual material that's going to um, accompany this talk. And so at least she joins us on the screen. And the first bit um, will be shown just right now. Ordinary things can can become mythological if you have the imaginative impetus. I don't mean that people can necessarily bring about transformations or anything like that. In terms of the outside world, but I think that they can transform their inside worlds to some extent. A tremendous number of the stories I write begin with something real. If you were asked to describe yourself, how would you? Oh, a tall, long face, tail, a particular story with a particular configuration, and uh, probably a struggling story to some extent. Because you've struggled towards a sort of unavailable perfection. In the beginning, there was suggestions that I'd never make it. I think that one of the things for me and my particular family was I always said that I wanted to be a writer. And my parents would say, uh, with a great deal of justification, well, you can't be a writer, you can't make a living as a writer. It wasn't that they didn't encourage my writing but they just wanted me to come, become something very stable as well, which I did. But when I became a writer, uh, I'd crossed over from one state of self to another. You have a story called The Bridge Builder in which there's a bridge builder father yes. and a son, Merlin, with a magic word. I've always thought that when writers invent magic in their stories that they draw on things that seem magical and mythical in their own lives. It would be certainly true in my life because my father was a bridge builder 
and he used to take us in the weekends out to visit bridges that he was in the process of building. And later on, of course, as I started to write, it seemed to me to take on a sort of symbolic function because you were uniting one bank with the opposite bank. Um, you were giving people a chance to cross over. It seems to underlie quite a lot of our processes in life as we cross over from childhood to adolescence, adolescence to adulthood. It's never quite as simple as, simple as it sounds, but we cross from one state to another. Sometimes the stories you write are mysteries to yourself in a way when you begin. You know the story's there to be told. You have to work out exactly what the story is. The actual act of writing, or of course these days putting it on the computer, uh, seems to release something in you that allows you to make contact with the true form of the story. Uh, and then I print it off and read it aloud to myself. Reading it aloud is a very important part of the evolution of the story. And it needs to be read aloud, in my case at any rate, it needs to be read aloud from pages rather than the screen. Margaret, I've sometimes heard people say that they've never written a book, but they would quite like to, and they thought they'd start with a children's book. What do you say to that? So I think implicit in that uh, comment is the idea that Children's books are just less from a literary point of view than an adult book. There's certainly people who've said to me, looking at me rather sternly, when are you going to write an adult book? Meaning, when, when are you going to put aside all these childish things and get on with real writing? I, I would strongly uh, contest that writing for children is an inferior literary form than writing for an adult. Mm. And exactly why I write children's stories is a mystery, but I write it out of, a, I think, a similar impetus to that which causes people to write adult books. So in that video clip, uh, Margaret describes herself as a tall, long-faced tale and a struggling story to some extent, and she says that refers to her struggle towards a sort of unavailable perfection as a writer. But I think um, there are probably lots of other things that she had to struggle with, both in her personal life and in her career as a writer. Um, you've known her for so long, Joy. Did, do you know what kinds of struggles she, she fought? Um, I don't feel that I can talk about that, but I do know that she did struggle. She struggled with finding herself, finding her stories, and it was the hero's journey. But I think all writers do this, you know. We have trials by fire, and we rise phoenix-like and in a different form from the ashes. Uh, people who don't have that kind of struggle, well, if they're writing, probably that writing will be superficial. It won't have the depth that Margaret's has. So do you think, in a way, the stories that she writes is the same story written again and again, trying to find herself? No, it wouldn't, it's not as simple as that. But the stories that she writes are continually confronting challenges. And she'd set up the challenges herself. Because I think she understood that struggle is the great treasure for a writer. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does, definitely. <laughs> Um, coming back for a moment to her self-description, um, she said a, long, a tall, long-faced tale and a struggling story. How, how would you describe her? When, when you think of her, um, the first words that come to your mind, um, what would they be? Kate? Playful. Um, I knew Margaret in later years. Um, oddly enough, though, I grew up in Christchurch. I didn't know about Margaret until I met her um, at a forum where she was introducing the great English writer for children, Joan Aiken. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me in retrospect that that was a very typical Margaret moment because she, she experienced as much joy in other people's work and in the act of reading mm -hmm. as she did in producing her own work and meeting her own readers. Um, and in the years afterwards when I met her, mostly in a professional 
capacity. Um, we had long, interesting conversations, but what always kind of bubbled up was an incredible playfulness, uh, a sort of, the word that she seemed to use most often in writing, in essays, and in conversation was the word astonishing. And that seemed to me the way that she looked at the world. She never lost, and this is something that the great writers for children never lose, that capacity to see the world as a child and continue to be astonished by it. The minutiae and, and, and the big parts of life. So everything had story capacity and everything had the capacity to delight. So I would say playfulness and sort of joyfulness. Mm -hmm. David, what, what, what do you think? <clears throat> well, um, I've got to agree with uh, Kate. Um, um, but I think the other thing I saw, and I again, I'm like Kate, I, I really only really got to know Margaret in her last, late, later years, was her, um, well, one, a fantastic mind and incredible imagination, but the other thing was her generosity. I think that she was um, fabulously sort of down to earth with... with um, other writers, and especially young young writers who, are, who held her in awe, of course, and you would always see her taking time to to encourage people, to listen to what they had to say, to, to take them seriously. And I think that was that's part of her, um, you know, you know what she's left to us in, in New Zealand. There's a, there's a lot of young writers who who have been nurtured by by Margaret and her generosity. I think she was a fabulous woman. Can I add to that? That's Margaret as a person, but then you meet Margaret on the page, and that's kind of a different thing. And, and there were many Margarets on the page because there were picture books, poems, and the young adult literature. And um, the sort of complexity of the person became more available, I think, in the texts. And I think Joy's right. Um, it was interesting when Margaret died, and Elizabeth Knox pointed this out to me, there was a lot of talk, as, as there is when someone treasured dies, about Margaret almost, almost being like a, a saint-like kind of figure. She certainly had tremendous sort of treasure. She was a treasure for most of New Zealand. But I think hero is a much better word, and Joyce pointed out, because the hero has a struggle. And the things that propelled Margaret to, to write, the sort of in a struggle, not just as a writer, but as a person, are really available on the page. So though I wouldn't say ever that I was intimate with Margaret, I feel that on some level I recognised many aspects of her because of the stories she made, which um, confront some of the sort of most difficult aspects of human existence. So in her stories, um, she, she mentioned in the beginning that they often start off um, as a kind of ordinary family story, maybe, um, an everyday event that occurs. But then something else comes into that story. And I think this is one of the um, wonderful things that she was able to do, that to convert everyday events into something magical, something supernatural or maybe not supernatural. You, you don't really know. Um, Joy, you have some kind of really nice stories um, to add to that. Yes, I do. But I would add to that and say that her great sense of wonder made her able to put the, a juxtaposition between the ordinary and something quite fantastic. Mm. So she transformed the ordinary in this way. Um, and I would add to the fact that she had... Um, not only just a great imagination and intelligence, but she had instant wit. We had a kaleidoscope program done in the 1970s, done at her place together. At the end of that, the director said to us, um, can any of you think of a few words to wind this up? And if you had given me a pen and a sheet of paper and an hour, I could have thought of a few words. But Margaret said instantly, when one embarks on a weekend convivial, it can be serious, it can be trivial. Um, um, I also heard you say that there was um, some incident where she, both you and her at some point drove off um, in your car with a pan of stew on the roof. We have done that at different... We had parallels, which we used to laugh about. We, we both did that independently, different parts, but it was also containing stew. I, I don't know... If, I didn't ask her if she salvaged hers. Mine shattered on the road. Um, but we 
tended to sometimes to be absent-minded, we would have phone calls because we're at a distance and talk about things. Sometimes it was things we'd done and sometimes we'd be playing with words and then they would roll like a snowball until they, between us until they became a story. Um, but there were extraordinary coincidences, quite apart from the ones already mentioned. Without knowing it, each of us got a tattoo as elderly women in the same year it was in the same place, in the upper arm, and we both got a rose. <laughs> and, and neither knew until the, you know, we, we, we mentioned it. Um, but you said the reason for getting the tattoo um, might be different. Well, hers was um, because she, was, she wanted the experience to write about it. For me, it was leaving the Marlborough Sounds where I had a big rose garden. So I decided to take a rose with me. Um, we talk about Margaret, and of course, to us, it's, it's obvious that she is one of the most treasured New Zealand writers. But for quite a long time, it seems that she was more popular and more well known outside of New Zealand than inside. And I mentioned that in the beginning that um, some of the New Zealand publishers were not that interested in her work because they thought um, the books were not didn't, didn't have enough New Zealandishness in them. Um, how, how did that happen? Well, I mean, that w would have been true for the publishers, but I wouldn't say that she was less popular for that reason because her books were imported and well used in schools and children loved them. I had an experience in a small country school, and this would have been in the early 1970s, and a young boy sitting in front of me listened to every word I said, and at the end of it, he asked... How long did it take to write Lion in the Meadow? <laughs> and I said, I didn't write Lion in the Meadow. Margaret Mahi did. And his face changed. And he said, you mean you're not Margaret Mahi? <laughs> he had wasted his time. <laughs> so she was very popular in the early 1970s in schools in New Zealand. And that must have been partly because of the school journal. Wouldn't it have been? Because it would have been. The stories had come through the yes. school journal as well. So maybe for the German audience who doesn't know, the School Journal is a publication that's distributed um, free of charge to schools all over New Zealand. And it's been the birthplace, so to speak, of many um, New Zealand writers. Mm -hmm. So what they did publish was lots of short stories and poems of hers. And there was a whole um, issue devoted to her work at one stage, wasn't there? Which was, it was. unheard of, yeah. Mm -hmm. And David points out it was also the birthplace for many illustrators. Exactly, yeah. Um, in, in 1980, at the age of 44, she decided to finally become a full-time writer. Um, and she said this was a huge turning point for her and, and her life. Um, how and, and why did she decide to do that? Do you know? Well, I think... Um, I can't answer that exactly, but... Um, it seems to me it was probably so she could write more lengthily. I mean, uh, up until that point, she'd been balancing work and her family and writing. So I know that um, Margaret wrote long into the night. I mean, for many years, she was completely sleep-deprived. At her memorial service, there were some very sweet and entertaining stories from the librarians that she worked with about um, <clears throat> exactly how her sleep deprivation manifested in everyday um, work at the library and um, Margaret apparently could sort of catalogue half asleep standing up although someone tended to have to fix it later or she could be at a meeting and have a little nap so she was really she was like the character in the railway children she was like Inez but she was writing to support her family and at that point I think once her picture books had become published overseas and she was building a kind of momentum as a writer I think it was possible then for her. And was that after the winning of the Carnegie Medal? I can't remember mm. what the dates were exactly. Uh, no, bef I think before Just slightly that, beforehand. Just before oh, no, because at that point she was then able, once she'd retired from working, to write full-length novels. And that's when things really took off. Yeah. And I think, too, at that stage she was just overworked, trying to keep everything together. Because I remember once in a phone conversation she said, how do you keep up with children's letters? She was always very generous. She wrote to children. If people asked her to talk, she would say yes. 
She, too generous. Mm, she was very out. generous. <laughs> um, I said that in the introduction, she won um, more awards than um, people can imagine, and one of the most important ones was probably the Hans Christian Andersen Award um, in 2006. It was probably um, one of the pivotal moments in her life as a writer, and I would like to quote um, from the decision of the jury. And they said, in awarding the 2006 Hans Christian Andersen Medal for writing to Margaret Mahi, the jury has recognized one of the world's most original reinventors of language. Mai's language is rich in poetic imagery, magic, and supernatural elements. Her oeuvre provides a vast, numinous, but intensely personal metaphorical arena for the expression and experience of childhood and adolescence. Equally important, however, are her rhymes and poems for children. Mai's works are known to children and young adults all over the world. And, of course, we were not with her at that moment, but um, we do have a small video clip that tells us um, what it was like for her. The winner of the 2006 Anderson Medal for writing is Margaret Mahi. If I think about Margaret and the Hans Christian Andersen Award, um, I have to say it doesn't surprise me at, at, at all um, for all kinds of reasons. I mean, I love what she writes, so that's, that's, that's purely personal. But there's also the range of approach as well, which I think is, is, is very important. Margaret Mahi lives in New Zealand, but she belongs to the world. And I wrote that before the Hans Christian Andersen Award, so I think that they were right to do it. I've added the adjective Mahian to my personal dictionary. Comparable to other adjectives such as Dickensian, Kafkaesque, Rabbinesian, Mahian. What is Mahian? What is Mahian? It's quite it's 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 difficult. I think I I think I can't describe it, but I think I know what it tastes like. And it's, there is something with Margaret, it's something about language, and it's something not quite what you expected, but it makes sense. If I think what the element in her stories are, I would always come back to the element of magic and the element of taking the mundane and turning it on its head and looking through her own prismatic, highly coloured I. Her writing and her persona are so interlinked for me that I, I, I think of them in, in, the, in, the same, in the same burst of, of, of warm energy. She is, uh, her whimsicality, her wit, and, and, uh, and her wisdom are, are, are irresistible. Her use of words is so delightful and so imaginative and so unique, and uh, her celebration of, of, uh, of the expressiveness of language and, and, and the, the, the gentle humor and, and, uh, and uh, the, the irresistible characters that, that she creates. Every time I had a Margaret Mahi story to do, I was very pleased. I was very stimulated because I knew I was going to have fun. I liked the thought children are going to have a laugh and fun and enjoy the story. I liked the thought that I can augment the writing. And also what I like about Margaret's writing is she doesn't <coughs> write the witch was wearing a red shawl and a long black skirt and she rode on a broomstick. She leaves what things look like to the illustrator and she cuts to the chase and says what the witch wants to do and what the witch says. So Margaret gives you that wonderful character, Mrs. Kathy Squinch, and all she tells you is she was not very respectable looking. So that gave me a, 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 a great deal of freedom as an artist to, uh, to decide how was Mrs. Squinch not very respectable looking. And I gave her a rat necklace and, and, uh, and uh, those, those fur pieces that uh, women used to wear of animals, and I, uh, uh, and, which I always thought were very weird and intriguing when I was a kid. So I gave Mrs. Squinch one made of rats. It's wonderful. You don't have to say, what shall I draw now? You know, if you've got someone there, say, you could draw, you could draw. I always like to sort of treat the book as a, as a whole, if possible, not just a few pictures dotted about. So I want you to think about it as, the, as a complete thing. And nonsense seemed to lend itself to that. And I felt so much at home, I'm afraid I did things that I didn't ask permission for. So that at the beginning, the, uh, all the printing instructions, you know, the, the bibliographical, bibliographical notes, 
are in a speech balloon of someone who's singing. And I sort of extend it, and there's, there's something which says, someone, a disapproving reader, who says, Margaret Mahe and Quentin Blake, at their age, they should have learnt more sense. And then somebody else is saying, no, they just learn more nonsense, <laughs> which is certainly true. So, I mean, it was, it was a, a spiritual affinity, really. This is something I've never forgotten. Margaret's uh, word is, if you invite a witch into your house, you cannot get rid of her, because you will have invited her in. She may stay forever. And again, you know, it's just a lovely slant on, <laughs> on a child on a boring day with it raining outside, baking, and playing imaginary games. But then again, it could be true. And that is Margaret's skill, I think, that she, she can make you believe anything. Oh, cool. Can I say something? I think that um, Hans Christian Andersen Award was the sort of apotheosis of Margaret's career, but I think a really significant award must have been the Carnegie Medal, not only because it was overseas recognition, but because it was a librarian's award, mm -hmm. and it had been awarded to the great and glorious writers of a literary tradition that she was absolutely steeped in because, above all else, she was also a reader and she knew the tradition within which she was writing and she believed very strongly that the reader was half of the writing process. So I think the Carnegie Medal would have been really important to her too. Yeah, and I read a wonderful um, quote that uh, something she said, um, writing is regarded as actively creative and reading is regarded as passive, but I think that reading is actively creative too. And I speak with authority on this because I feel that I am made the person I am by what I have read. And I think that yeah. actually ties in nicely with what you said. Because I, I once asked her, whether um, given a choice, it's a sort of ridiculous question, but it is an interesting one to ask writers. If you had to choose between writing and reading, if there was only one available to you, to you which would it be? And even though in some ways she was a compulsive writer because she was conversing with herself when she was writing, she said, I would choose reading because it is endlessly capable of reforming me as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and she was, that, that was part of her generosity, knowing that the process wasn't over until the reader received it. Mm -hmm. Um, in The Word Witch, in fact, there's a, a poem I think she wrote as a very young girl at secondary school called The Burnt Library. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 well, it actually happened, I think, in her school. The, the school uh, library went up in flames. But it's really a catalogue of all the reading that she had done, this lament for the books that had all gone up in smoke. Um, and even at a young stage, obviously, she, as you say, steeped in... In, 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 in English, in yeah. English, English literature. So was it difficult to, to illustrate that one? No, let me think. I, no, I think I did a burning book. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't one of the hard ones. You took the easy way yeah, out. I did, I did, <laughs> yes, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of illustrating, um, we just saw um, various illustrators yes. um, talking about <laughs> Margaret, and both Jenny Williams and Stephen Kalk uh, commented on the fact that Margaret's texts um, give illustrators a lot of freedom um, because she doesn't write what the person actually looks like. Um, she gives that to the illustrator. So, um, first of all, would you agree? And if oh, so... Oh, definitely, definitely. She was really just always seemed to be delighted and enthusiastic about what you were doing and always very interested in it. But I don't think I ever, she ever said anything that um, was a criticism or um, directed me in any way. I think it was always just a shared idea, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is certainly true for the word witch, but you said with, um, well, with the moon one. and Farmer McPhee, um, the creation process was actually the other way around. You came up with the story. Mm, Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'd, I'd just finished The Word Witch, and um, it was such a fantastic opportunity and such a privilege to actually work with Margaret's material. And I toiled away on it, um, but still when the book was finished, and of course the publishers eventually ring you up and say, come on, where is it? Oh, you know, where are the drawings? And I still had this nagging doubt about some of the drawings that I had done, I just felt like I missed the boat. And I sort of was in my studio with my head in my hands thinking, well, how could I have done that? 
And I desperately wanted to do um, something else with Margaret. And at that stage, she was, she was, she, I think she was a little bit frail. And, and so my wife, in fact, said, you know, get out of your studio and go for a drive. And I basically did. I came up with an idea of, about just getting out and enjoying yourself, having a look around, you know. So it was more about me than anything else. But when I came up with the idea, I thought, my goodness, you know, that's the sort of thing Margaret would like. It's sort of her philosophy. So I just jumped in the car. I roughed up the, the, the story, which is basically about a, a farmer who is working so hard on his farm that he, he doesn't pay attention to how beautiful it is. And it takes the animals and the moonlight to actually bring bring out the beauty you know, and make him realise it. It's not an original idea, but it was something that I knew Margaret would like. And I, as I said, I roughed it up jumped in the car, drove up to Governor's Bay and said, Margaret, what about it? Do you want to do the words for this book? And she, you know, the usual Margaret sort of generosity and her way of dealing with books, she said, fine, yes, let's do it, you know, and away we went. Um, and she, she put, of course, her wonderful twists and things into things, which I think makes the book far better than anything I could have done. But I think it really showed her generosity of spirit and her willingness to just see the creation of books as being something that we can all do. And I think, as um, Kate was saying before, you know, this idea, when we actually launched the book, she said, um, you know, David's had a go at this story, I've had a go at this story, and uh, it's up to you to make the other half by bringing yourself to the story as a reader. So I think it's just a part of that whole philosophy about what reading and what books are. And so I was delighted to be able to have done that with her. It was great, yeah. And, and you can definitely see that in the longer novels, and the teenage novels, there are sort of quite um, meaty philosophical discussions she as a writer is having with her characters. But she's inviting the reader in to speculate about these things as well, whether it's in a tweaked universe or a realistic universe. Yes, because she was very interested in philosophy. As I said, she, she also studied philosophy at university. And um, at one point she said, everything that she writes, um, there's some, some philosophy that's underneath it, even if it's a picture book and seems to be a very simple story. But there is some deep philosophical thought underneath it. And that's just something you can't escape if you've studied philosophy for a while. Um, and something else that she was very interested in was um, the paranormal. And Joy, you said you had some very interesting discussions with her on that because she was not so much interested in the kind of structure of the paranormal but in the effects that it had. Mm. Yes, we had um, well, a couple of interesting conversations. One of them happened after we'd read a book. I think it was called Religion and the Decline of Magic. And we, we didn't find the that the book presented anything new to us. We both read the book in the same year. Um, but it did spark off a discussion about writing, how we seem to live in about 10% of reality confined by our senses to what we can see, hear, taste, touch, smell. So we're in this prison of a body, and the other 90%, which is all around us, the infinite, the ineffable the world of spirit, whatever you like to call it, somehow trickles through by osmosis when the writer goes to a deep place. It's as though we go into the well of our being and at the bottom there is all of this great, great landscape that's making itself available, but it doesn't have any words, so we have to invent metaphors for it. Would you say that's it, Kate? I mean, the haunting illustrates that there's always the sense of moving to another kind of understanding mm. of self, of the world, of otherness, um, moving through, I think you used the, the word joy, moving, or maybe it was you, David, going through a window, going through a portal yes. to um, another reality. And um, it's certainly, the and, 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 and that then means interrogating aspects of the writing process and the power around being a writer and the power and responsibility of just being a human being. So, yeah, completely alert to all that and inviting readers to speak just to just need to be people. open to it. But uh, the interesting thing that we both felt when we were talking about this was that it wasn't as though we were reaching out to it, that it came to us. And yet... Unbidden. 
Yeah, that's right. Just, so we just were there and, and it... Yeah. But yeah. Margaret seemed to have a completely um, uh, advanced understanding of the sort of paradoxes of writing. And because she had to earn a living from it, she knew that sort of on the one hand, you, and I love this phrase that she used, you have to go out into the world and wrench story from the world. You have to be alert to it all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, once you are um, launched on the writing of it, then the other then mysterious comes self in. comes mm -hmm. into play. And of course, in that moment, um, everything that propels you as a person, the things that you are curious about or worry about or are fascinated by, become part of the story. Um, of course, we can't talk about all of her, her novels, but uh, you said that the um, other side of silence? No. Yes, no, the other yeah. side of silence is... It's is one of your favourite books. Yeah. Um, I think because at the heart of that story is the um, mystery and paradox and um, the difficulties around being a writer mm -hmm. and, um, and, 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 and the difficulties around self. I mean, the hero in that story, who was called Hero, um, is constantly debating the business of her true self and her real self. And there are sort of um, nuances in there that are so beautifully um, teased out. But the other thing I love about that book is that it is using the structure of fairy tale and a, and a um, lesser known Grimm's fairy tale um, Jorinda and Jorindale, um a as the sort of grid for the story, but she uses that grid to um, sort of um, move the story forward, but the real propulsion of the story are the things that Margaret wants to um, investigate and try and understand, and, that, and, and, and I think mostly it's about the power of being a writer and how you can use that for ill or good, and, and what your responsibilities are therein. Mm -hmm. Um, so she said, is, it is in the nature of books that they have the capacity to make you feel powerful about what you can alter and achieve in your life. Yeah, and all through her picture books, um, uh, particularly her picture books and her stories, there are people um, with pen substitutes, wands or burglars who are you know, getting into people's lives or pirates who are stealing. I mean, the agents of anarchy mm -hmm. are analogues for the writer most of the time. So she was sort of in all her stories herself, yeah. as a writer. And, and even if she, um, she once said that she doesn't believe in, in ghosts or magic as such, but uh, magic to her still is very important. And um, because I'm just seeing out of the corner of my eye the illustration for um, the poem Magic, um, how, um, th this is a poem where she um, wonders whether magic has gone from the world, and if so, if, if the world is just a place without magic, then it's not the place for her. Um, and I think it's a beautiful poem. Unfortunately, I can't um, recite it off the top of my head, but um, I love the illustration for it that we can see right behind us there. Um, what was the feeling for you when you, when you read that poem, and, and did, did it and kind of image spring to your mind um, immediately, or did you struggle with that for a long time? Um, I think the one thing that I really tried to do with a word which that um, I had the advantage of was I knew Margaret and I was very fond of her, and I could hear her voice a lot. I'd seen her perform lots of her poems, especially the famous ones like Bubble Trouble and down the back of the chair. Um, so in that, I, she bounced and that. She bounces across the waves. And so that was Margaret to me. It wasn't necessarily an illustration of magic. It was an illustration of Margaret <laughs> <laughs> bouncing away, you know, in her eggshell. And so I think that's what I tried to capture. Um, sometimes, you know, being an illustrator can be a lot of fun because you don't actually need to follow the text all that closely. But... So I was really illustrating that fondness for Margaret, I suppose, rather than, I have to be honest, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> so it's a picture of Margaret. It's Lots wonderful. of those illustrations are. Yes. 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 Um, I'm afraid we're running out of time very quickly here. Um, there's one more thing that I would like to um, mention. That Kate, you said that um, myths and fairy tales and folk tales were very important to Margaret in, in all of her writing, you can see that. And Joy, you've brought um, a wonderful 
short story or um, poem with you about the um, what the storyteller is, and this is, I think, the the key issue in in all of her stories. It's the importance of the of the storyteller, not only of the story, but the storyteller. Well, I actually wrote this about Margaret after I had read Memory, which is still one of my favourite books, and it's about Margaret as a storyteller. The storyteller is a thief, stealing stars at night and hammering them into dishes for bread and butter days. The storyteller is a magician, making doors that are never either open or shut and windows you can put to your eye to see over horizons. The storyteller is a seamstress, stitching the ordinary things of earth to make wondrous garments for long and difficult journeys. The storyteller is a liberator, knocking down walls with a thrust of a pen and wrenching wide open seed, egg, stone, brick, word to set truth free. Thank you very much, Joy. I think this sums up um, our whole discussion very nicely. Um, and it especially sums up what Margaret was and what her life was about. Um, but of course, in a session like this, we would like to give the last word of the session to Margaret herself. So I would like to thank you all for um, talking with us this afternoon. I would like to thank you all for coming. But the last word of the session belongs to Margaret. Uh, quite often in everyday life, I find myself unconsciously um, testing words for their possibilities. I try out spoonerisms to quite a big extent, you know, where you swap the initial letters of words over. Um, I look for rhymes, I think. I do, all, I do that just unconsciously. And uh, every now and then something occurs which makes, which sort, which fixes me. And I think... I can do something with that. Further Adventures of Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty, the king of the eggs, ran down the road on his little short legs. After him, quickly, came 42 cooks who lived in a castle of cookery books, charging and barging the length of the street, holding their egg beaters ready to beat, shouting out, omelettes, and scrambled as well. What a terrible shock for a king in the shell. <laughs> Down the back of the chair. A car is slow to start and go. We can't afford a new one. Now, if you please, Dad's lost the keys. We're facing wreck and ruin. No car, no work. No work, no pay. We're getting poorer day by day. No wonder Dad is looking grey. The future is a blue one. Nothing but dockets in his pockets, raging with despair. Dad acts appalled. Though fairly bald, he tries to tear his hair. But Mary, who is barely two, says, Dad should do what I would do. I lose a lot, but I find a few down the back of the chair. Well, he's patted himself. He's searched each shelf. He's hunted here and there. So now he'll kneel and try to feel down the back of the chair. Oh, it seemed to grin as his hand went in. He felt it quiver against his skin. What will the troubled father win from down the back of the chair? Some hairy string and a diamond ring were down the back of the chair. Pineapple peel and a conger eel were down the back of the chair. A sip, a sup, a sop, a song. A spider, seven inches long. No wonder that it smells so strong down the back of the chair. A packet of pins and one of the twins were down the back of the chair. A fan, a pan that belonged to Grant, down the back of the chair. A cup, a comb, a crown, a cat. A pirate with a treasure map. A dragon trying to take a nap, down the back of the chair. A drake, a rake, a smiling snake were down the back of the chair. A string of pearls. A lion with curls down the back of the chair. A skink, a skunk, a skate, a ski. A couple of elephants drinking tea. The bandicoot and the bumblebee were down the back of the chair. <gasps> but what is this? Oh, bliss, oh, bliss, down the back of the chair. 
the long lost will of Uncle Bill down the back of the chair, his money box all filled with cash, tangled up on the scarlet sash, this treasure, pleasure, toys and trash down the back of the chair. I found our dreams, our father beams, down the back of the chair. Well, at last I see how life can be down the back of the chair. Forget the keys. We're poor no more. Just call a taxi to the door. The taxi shot out with a roar from down the back of the chair. The chair, the chair, the challenging chair, the champion chair, the cheerful chair, the charming chair, the children's chair, the chip and chopped but chosen chair to think our fortune rested there down the back of the chair. Thank you very much indeed. Kia ora, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good Abend. Thank you to Joy and David and to Katie. Kanui te mihi kia, kia koe te whaia, Margaret, mahi. I tēnei wā, and now we have a wonderful performance by two amazing young women, young wahine from Aotearoa, Miss Ria Hall and her cousin, Paul Waikens. So we'll just get the stage ready. Um, please help yourself. At the at the end here, we have a, a cash bar. It's happy. It's a happy hour of song and a little bit of rhythm and a little bit of kōrero, but mostly these two wonderful women. Please help yourself. There. Oh, when I say help yourself, buy yourself some kiwi wine, some kiwi beer, and some kiwi other bits and pieces. It is so lovely to see you here this evening. Hope you've all had a great day. Welcome to our whare, New Zealand in the house. Lovely to see you. We'll be back in two minutes. Thank you. <laughs>